Let's turn in our Bible to Daniel chapter 11 once again this morning, if you will, please. Daniel 11, first 35 verses. Although when they were given to Daniel, they were prophecy, they've already been fulfilled. So when we read the first 35 verses, we're actually reading history. And uh, that was established last week. However, we're at verse 36. And verse 36 and following is all future prophecy. There is really a break in the flow when you hit verse 36. And uh, this is what I'm talking about. Look at uh, the 35th verse. See that phrase, even to the time of the end? See that phrase in verse 35? That really is a code phrase for the last days of this present age that we're living in. And then if you look at verse 36, it talks about this king that will do according to his will, exalt himself, magnify himself above every god, speak marvelous or blasphemous things against the god of gods, and he shall prosper, notice this, until the indignation be accomplished. The indignation that is referred to as being accomplished is a prophetic term in the context, and it specifically refers to the 70th week of Daniel and the latter half of that 70th week, which is when everything that God has prophesied regarding the chastening of the nation of Israel will come to completion. So that's what the indignation is referring to. Also, if you continue on in chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, the setting in those verses is very clearly a time of unparalleled turbulence in Israel. And then followed by, of course, a resurrection, which is going to take place at the end of the last days. So that just gives us a little bit of a footing and a map as to where we are. Again, a reminder, between verse 35 and verse 36 of Daniel 11, we leap across centuries to the final and to the great time of persecution upon the nation of Israel. And that king that is uh, referred to beginning in verse 36, the king that will do according to his will, is none other than the greatest anti-Semite that ever has or ever will live. He's called the Antichrist, sometimes referred to as the beast in the book of Revelation. And he is going to persecute Israel like they've never been persecuted. You talk about a Holocaust, nothing like the Holocaust that is yet ahead, according to the prophetic scripture. This same king is referred to as the little horn. If you are with us, when we looked at Daniel chapter 7, he is that little horn that will rise out of the final form of the Roman Empire. And that will happen and will then trigger what is referred to in Daniel 9 and verse 27 as the 70th week of Daniel. That seven-year period, again, of unparalleled suffering and persecution of the Jewish people during that day. What happens is this king, this antichrist that will rise in those last days will start off very deceptively as a ruler that wants to bring world peace. And it will seem as if he has accomplished that. But in the end, he will ignite a holocaust that will end in what is called that last battle of Armageddon, which, of course, will precipitate our Lord's 
our Messiah, Jesus, his glorious second coming as he returns to this earth, just as he's promised. This is the setting for that. Daniel 11, verses 36 to 45. It's heavy stuff. It's very full of prophecy. We need God to guide us. Let's pause and look to him. Heavenly Father, we come to you. This is your word. Your spirit breathed it out. And so we're dependent upon you to make it uh, understandable to us. And we thank you. You've given us that anointing. You've given us that unction from the Holy One, the Spirit of God himself, to be our teacher. And so we're looking ultimately to you to be our teacher today. And we pray that you'll use this passage not only in a way to give us increased understanding of the last days, but even more importantly, to give us practical uh, impetus to live for Jesus and to not waste our days on this earth, but rather redeem the time because the days are evil. The Lord, undertake for us. We're incapable and we're insufficient. Our sufficiency is in you alone. And we call upon you. We claim your enabling power, both to the one that uh, brings the message and to those that hear the message. Open, Lord, our ears and our hearts. And may we receive precisely what you want us to receive today. And we'll thank you in advance and want to give Jesus all the glory as we Pray it for his sake. Amen. Well, really what you have in verse 36, 37, 38, and 39 is the character of Antichrist. You get a little glimpse into his personality. And I would say this, that this person, this future person, going to be a human being, but certainly will be satanically inspired like no other human being ever before. He will be evil personified. He is called in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, both the man of sin and the son of perdition. Pretty powerful descriptions of this man's character. In fact, look at verse 36 with me as we begin, Daniel eleven thirty-six, 36, and here we get a glimpse of his power. It says, and the king shall do according to his will. He'll exalt himself and he'll magnify himself above every god. And he's going to prosper in all of this. He is going to be a powerful individual. He is also, his power really is the epitome of selfishness. His power is all based upon his self-will, what he wants to accomplish, what his goals and agenda are all about. And he will, in a self-centered way, enforce his will, not only on Israel, but on the entire earth. He will absolutely seize global power. He'll be the sovereign of the earth. He will be satanically empowered. You might say in some ways, uh, if not literally, he will, uh, he will epitomize uh, Satan in a human body, an evil man. He will be the head of a Western 10-nation coalition. Those nations will submit to his leadership. And he will have the ability given to him by Satan himself to perform miracles, signs, and wonders. And as a result, he will deceive many on this earth. Daniel 9.27 tells us that he will make a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. He will guarantee that the, the nation of Israel will be totally secure and will have no worries. And uh, he will also become the Western world's defender, having a global one world government and military 
and eventually, as we'll see in a moment, religion. He's a man that obviously will be full of himself, not only powerful, but prideful, a man full of himself. When you read what we already read in verse 36, and when you read uh, as we continue in verse 37, he's not going to regard the God of his fathers. He's not going to have a respect for any God or gods. That uh, he's a man that is a narcissist. He's a man that is an egotist. He's a man that will initially, initially tolerate other religions because he will try to make a peaceful uh, entrance. But eventually, according to that 37th verse, he is going to completely disregard the ancestral gods that he, uh, uh, of, the, of the, uh, the fathers that he came from. And obviously, he is going to disregard the Messiah of Israel. He's actually going to be a total atheist. He'll reject all established religions, and he will destroy the one world church. And uh, as a result, he will then desolate the temple that we will be rebuilt during those days in Jerusalem. He'll desolate that temple, and he will declare himself to be the deity, the God, and will demand that not only the Jewish people, but everyone else worships him there in Jerusalem. So his character is beginning to develop here in these verses. He's a man that is powerful, a man that is prideful, but he's also a man that is very profane. Because you read in that, uh, uh, that 36th verse that when he lifts himself up and exalts himself, he will also speak marvelous things against the God of gods. And what marvelous things means is he will be the supreme blasphemer of God. He will make totally shocking claims about the God of the Bible, about the God of the Jews. He will be the supreme blasphemer, and his blasphemy will be unparalleled in human history. We are told that about the little horn in Daniel 7 and verse 25, where it says about him, he'll speak great words against the Most High. You can read even more detail in Revelation chapter 13, where the Antichrist is described as that beast that rises out of the sea of humanity and how that he is just bent on totally blaspheming God. He will be an idolater. Not only will he offer himself as the object of worship, but he himself will worship. And you know what he's going to worship? He is going to worship nothing else but his power. Notice verse 38. In his estate, he shall honor the God of, for uh, of forces or literally the god of fortresses. He will idolize military force. He will be the person that truly says and means the god of force be with you because he will deify war and uh, he will pour huge amounts of money into building a Western world military machine that will enable him to wage war, and he will also reward those countries that he uh, envelops. He'll reward them for their loyalty to him. Look at what it says in verse 38 as we read on. He'll honor with gold, silver, and precious stones and pleasant things. He's looking for, re, uh, he's going to reward loyal followership. So that's a little bit of the Antichrist character. But I want us to even go deeper and uh, pick up in the uh, 30, uh, uh, the 40th verse, actually. Let's look at the 40th verse and look at his career. <clears throat> He's going to be an absolute global dictator. He's going to be an iron-fisted ruler. 
in verse 40, we read, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. With chariots, with horsemen, with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall also enter the glorious land, that's Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, and he names three countries. Verse 42, he shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold, silver, over all precious things of Egypt. The Libyans, Ethiopians shall be at his steps. What this really entails maybe not apparent in our English Bible, but what it really entails is this is an invasion that is taking place. And the invasion is such, it happens that during the first three and a half years of that seven-year period that Daniel calls the 70th week, there will be a revolt against Antichrist. And a military coalition will develop uh, that will involve what uh, the country of Russia, the country of Iran, the country of Germany, the country, uh, uh, the, the Arab nations, and some African allies as well. How do we know this? Because what's being referred to in that 40th and, uh, and uh, 40 through 43rd verse is what is called the Battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And in that passage, Ezekiel 38 and 39, we get the, the players in this war. And that's why I gave you the, the names of those nations. There will be a confederacy or a coalition of these nations that will come to invade the countries that Antichrist rules. And especially, it centers in on that glorious land that is the land of Israel. Now, remember... At the beginning, what triggers what triggers that 70th week of Daniel, what triggers what is called the tribulation period, is that the Antichrist signs a seven-year peace treaty with the nation of Israel. So he's bound himself to protect Israel. And the first three and a half years of that treaty, he will honor that, that uh, covenant with them. And so... He has to protect Israel that is being invaded by this northern coalition of, uh, of armies that uh, are trying to completely take over and destroy Israel. What happens, we don't have time to look at Ezekiel 37, or 38 and 39 rather, but what happens in those chapters is rather than Antichrist uh, rescuing Israel that is being invaded by this enormous army led by the Russians that are coming in from the north. What actually happens is God intervenes. There is divine intervention. And uh, this northern coalition is destroyed by God from heaven. And uh, so as a result, the Antichrist actually wins a victory but not because of himself, but because of God intervening on the behalf of Israel during that battle of Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 to 39. And then in the last two verses of this chapter, here is the last battle of what is known most famously as the Battle of Armageddon. I think one thing that uh, people ought to know that perhaps isn't as well known is the fact that Armageddon is not just one battle. It's a campaign. It's a bunch of battles. And the one that we have here prophesied is the last of that campaign of Armageddon, what is famously known as the Battle of Armageddon. And Armageddon is uh, from a Hebrew word that means Mount Megiddo. But it actually takes place in the valley below the ancient city of Megiddo. By the way, you can visit the ancient tell of Megiddo, and that, uh, that is 20 layers of civilization. 
it uh, it's the it's one of the oldest archaeological uh, digs uh, as far as civilization is concerned in the whole country of Israel, if not the world. But anyway, the battle of Armageddon is going to be, take place in the valley of Megiddo, just below uh, where that city once sat, on the plain of Esdraelon, it's called. And it is there that this will be played out. Look at uh, verse 44 with me. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. What happens is this. At the middle of that seven-year period, Daniel's 70th week, right at the middle of it, the Antichrist breaks his word, breaks his promise, breaks his covenant, his peace treaty with Israel, goes back on what he covenanted with them. And instead, he himself wants to take Israel and he wants to be the ruler and the one that is worshipped. So the last three and a half years of that seven-year period is the worst part of the entire seven-year, 70th week of Daniel. This is when Israel suffers the worst. And what's going to happen is, as we read here in verse 45, Antichrist will set up his, his headquarters in the temple on the, the glorious mount. He'll set up his headquarters in that, uh, that uh, tribulation temple that will be built, and he will sit there, he'll rule from there, he'll be worshipped there, and uh, there is at that moment, verse 44 tells us, he gets a message that there is a vast army from the east that is coming towards Israel, that is marching towards Israel. We're not sure uh, what that, uh, what the origin of that army from the East is. Uh, people have suggested it may be China. We don't know that for sure. But we do know that the book of Revelation uh, tells us in chapter 9 that that army that is marching from the East towards uh, Israel is an army that is 200 million strong. And it also will be joined with the remaining uh, northern coalition that uh, God devastated. They're going, who, whoever was left will regroup and they'll join with this eastern army. The idea is to bring about the utter uh, destruction of Israel during that time. They'll, the whole world, you might say, is gathered against them. Well, this arouses the Antichrist. They're all gathered to the Valley of Megiddo. And it's at that moment, Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, that uh, at that time, when the Antichrist desolates the Jewish temple sanctuary, and when all of these armies are gathered together, that at that very moment, there will be signs in the heavens. Immediately, the sun will stop shining. The moon will not give her light. The stars from heaven will fall. And then that is just the sign that it is now time for the glorious second coming of Messiah Jesus. And he will appear in the heavens. And he will come as Israel's deliverer. And when that happens, these armies that were gathered to oppose one another will now join forces together, and you'll have literally all of the armies of the world joining forces against Israel in order to fight uh, the Messiah who appears with these signs in heaven as he returns. They unite to fight Messiah Jesus. And what happens is a great defeat 
In fact, if I can uh, just read a little bit of how it's given to us in Revelation chapter 19, here's what we read. John says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then drop down a little bit farther to verse 19 in Revelation 19. And here is where we're at uh, in the last two verses of Daniel 11. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken. That's the Antichrist. The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which uh, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both, that is the Antichrist and his false prophet, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire, which burneth with brimstone or sulfur. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. That's what's happening in these closing verses. And that's why it says in verse 45 of Daniel 11, yet he, that is Antichrist, shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Because he is in the end clearly uh, shown to be fighting against no one else but God himself. And God puts an end to him and uh, to all of his uh, human forces. One thing that Daniel doesn't include here, but the prophet Zechariah does, is that at that very moment, Zechariah tells us that this all will be preceded by the greatest holocaust that the world has ever seen, and especially of, Jew of the Jewish people. We're told in Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 8 that two-thirds of the total worldwide Jewish population will be annihilated by the Antichrist. And the one-third rem remnant that remains, they will be the ones who see Messiah Jesus coming from heaven, and at that moment they'll recognize him, and they'll repent of their sin and the rejection of him, and they will receive him, and thus be spiritually cleansed and forgiven and saved. Robert Louis Stevenson famous author. He wrote about a ship in a violent stormy sea, and the ship was driven against the rocks, and uh, any moment it was going to be just broken to pieces, and the passengers in the ship, as he wrote, were all huddled together in terror, facing uh, sure death. But in the agony of the moment, one of the men said, I'm going to go up to the captain's uh, deck, and I'm going to see the captain. And he made his way up and up and finally came to the, the captain's uh, post. And he found that that, uh, that sea captain was actually tied to the post with his hands on the wheel of that ship, guiding it little by little and turning uh, little by little away from the rocks and out again into the deep of the ocean. And Stevenson said, that when the, the captain saw the intruder, he looked at the, his terror-stricken white face, and, and the captain looked at him and smiled. And the man turned, Stevenson said, and he went back to the deck below, 
and he shouted, all is well, all is well. I saw the captain's face and he smiled. And you know that, don't you? You've seen the captain's face and he smiled. For those of you that know the Lord, those of us that are saved, we don't really have any, we don't have any fear. We know that there is a wonderful future ahead. It's as the prophet Jeremiah said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, not of disaster. To bring you an expected end, to bring you a hope for the future. If you're a believer, you, you should be looking on the smile of the Savior. You should be finding your hope in him. If you don't know him, you don't have any hope. If you, know, if you don't know him, if you've never received Jesus, the Messiah, as your personal Savior, you have no hope in this life, and you have no hope in eternity. You'll go to be with the Antichrist and the false prophet to that lake of fire, and yet so unnecessary. Today, you can change your eternal destiny, and it simply involves you recognizing that you are a hell-deserving sinner, but Jesus already bore that penalty of hell for you. He took your place when he gave his life as that atonement for sin, as that covering and that forgiveness that he will offer you. Don't think that you can make it on your own righteousness. In God's eyes, there is no one that is righteous. The prophet Isaiah says that uh, all our self-righteousness, or the Jewish people would call it mitzvot, all of our righteousnesses are as nothing in God's sight. They're filthy, actually, to him. They're disgusting to him. There's only one hope that a Jew or Gentile or anyone has, and that is cling to Christ. Claim him as your Savior. Receive him as the one that can cleanse and forgive you of sin and make you his child and give you eternal life. You can take care of that. If you're not saved today, that's why God's brought you here. That's why you've tuned in. That's why this message has been given is that you might be saved today. And if you are a believer, then you know the smile of your Savior's face, and your hope is in him, and you don't have to fear whatever the future holds. Isn't it wonderful to know that as a believer, we're not going to be here for this stuff. We won't be around for the 70th week of Daniel. We will already be with the Lord. We will be rescued out of this mess. It's a wonderful hope that we have. And I think that we're the armies that come back with him who sits on that white horse. We're the armies that come back with him to establish his kingdom on this earth. Isn't that amazing? What a wonderful plan God has for his people. And he wants you to be one of his children. He wants you to be counted among his people today. And you can, as I, as I said a moment ago, by receiving Jesus. He is the Messiah of Israel. He is the promised one that came and is coming again. And you and I need to be ready. Let's pray.